Hi. Who's got my half? <laughs> We've got to talk afterwards. Um, four and a half years ago, I came to a point in my life where, you know, I'd sort of reached the end of my rope. And uh, I was sort of in a corner, and so I had to make some hard choices. And, and it had nothing to do with bravery. It had nothing to do with courage. It had to do everything with desperation. I like this quote by Mark Twain. I've suffered a great many catastrophes in my life. Most of them never happened. Because uh, this quote really epitomizes um, a lot of my life, uh, the kind of anxieties that I, that I experienced and the scenarios that I envisioned should I ever proceed with any kind of change. Um, just to bring the point about perception and how we sometimes perceive things and we and our brains have an amazing ability to take some small details and fabricate an image. Okay. Right now you're looking at a picture of me taken five years ago. Uh, it's upside down, your brain's got that right and you see a smiling face but the reality is it's a pretty horrendous picture. You can do this in Photoshop, you probably want to do this as Christmas presents now but... Uh, <laughs> So there's been some forces, some the things that have really influenced, the pretext and the context of my life. Um, these three words represent the forces that have really shaped um, uh, the choices that I make, uh, the, my behavior and all that. And at one time, one has been more important than the other. Fears, uh, my fear of rejection, my fear of being different, my fear of... Um, hurting loved ones, embarrassing people, uh, making people feel awkward, being ostracized, being thrown away. All those fears have uh, affected how I act. Family has also been a, a major force in my life. Um, it's been a good influence in my life. It's a, it's a place where I have found nurture, I have found safety, intimacy, love, um, memories, um, and, a, and a place where there, was, I, there could be an attempt at some normal, normalcy. Faith has also been really important to me. I've been a believer in Jesus Christ pretty much since I was a teenager, but my faith has been, aside from the fact that it gave me a hope that things could get better, it also um, was a source of strength. Um, and I credit my faith to the fact that it kept me, kept me sober and away from self-destructive behavior because um, that could have happened really easily. The downside of faith is that it also produced a huge amount of guilt uh, because I somehow just not, did not seem to measure up to some standard. So in trying to answer the question of who I am and what I was, what, wh who I am and, wh uh, and what I am, it was always complicated and it was always really confusing because I had uh, my beliefs to contend with and I had uh, some things, you know, when things are complex and there's chaos and confusion, you want to hold on to things that are simple and make sense and I grasped on to, uh, to some things out of context and in a sense I I, I abused myself with, with my faith. I'll just skip through these because we don't have time for these slides. And one of the verses that I probably used the most to sort of beat myself into submission was a verse that appears, or a passage that appears in two places in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, it appears in the context of a discussion that the disciples are having with Jesus about divorce. And he says, well, you've read for yourselves that in the beginning God created the male and female. For that reason, man will leave his mother, father and mother and be joined to his, to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, if you've ever been to a church wedding, you've probably heard those verses read. And if you haven't been to a church wedding, I assume most of you have seen a church wedding in a movie or in a, on TV. So it's, it's, it's not, a foreign, not a foreign thing. Um, but the problem is that I extracted one phrase out of this and took it out of context. And I made the mistake that you will hear in the news, and it's, I've heard it a ton of times in the last few weeks uh, with the whole debate and the controversy in California about the same-sex legislation. 
at interviews on the street, how do you feel about marriage or gay marriage? And they'll say, well, as far as I'm concerned, God created this male and female, and that's all there is. So um, I did the same thing with myself. I extracted this phrase. But I failed to read further down. And in this discussion about, um, about divorce and marriage, I, I never saw this. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't until about a, four and a half years ago that I, the scales began to fall off my eyes and I began to grapple with what it was that was really being communicated here. And it's something that Jesus interjects at the end of the discussion, which seems so bizarre to me because it seems so out of context. Why would he bring up the issue of eunuchs? And he, and he prefaces that by saying not everyone will be able to understand this. Some are born as eunuchs from their mother's womb. Some are made eunuchs by men. Others are, uh, there are some who make themselves eunuchs. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. I, I, threw, I always threw this away. I never really paid attention to it. But believe it or not, this is uh, coming to an understanding of what he meant here is what finally freed me to move on so that I could accept the diagnosis that I had received. Because when I, when I was diagnosed in 1999 with gender dysphoria, I, in my mind, part of me said, well, that's what the doctors say, but what does God say? And there was a clash. And it was important for me, before I could do anything, that, that my faith would not be trampled by, by uh, my choices, and that, on the, on the flip side, that if I held on to my faith, I wouldn't have to put my brain on the shelf. And so, for me, it was important that these two have a harmony and be um, not in conflict with each other. And this portion of, of the, that discourse or that discussion is what finally brought me to a point where I felt I had permission to continue to do what I had to do. And here's what's, what I learned about this passage. Number one, when Jesus says, not everyone understands this, and, and, and says, he who is able to receive it, let him receive it. It's a teaching device that he often used, like when he said, let him, let him who has ears hear, or him who has eyes see. What he's trying to do is induce, engage the, the listener to, I guess, engage the ego so that they say, hey, I want to be one of those who gets this, whatever it is he's saying. I want to be one of those who understands. It has nothing to do with being an elite or a person or anything like that. It's, it's a device that he wants to raise their awareness, their paradigm, wants to expand their focus. And so he uses their ego to, to kind of get them to want to be the, among those who, who understand it. But what's the significance about the eunuch? Well, in the context of relationships or intimacy, what he's basically saying is, yes, there is a stereotype. There is, in the beginning, God created the male and female, and that's the stereotype that everybody seems to hold on to and quote and pair. But it's, it's, more, it's more open than that. Consider the eunuch. Some people are born like that. They have no choice. Intersex child. Doctors have, and parents, when a, when a child is born with ambiguous genitalia, they have a tough decision to make. Is this child going to be raised as a boy or a girl? And, so, and they'll, make the, they'll make a determination, usually based on culture, based on uh, prejudice or whatever. They decide to go one way or the other. And according to, uh, to, uh, to research, they get it wrong 50% of the time. Because as that child uh, grows as a person and self-awareness about their sexuality and all that, they say, this is wrong. I don't feel right. I, they phrase me as a girl. I feel more like a guy or vice versa. So uh, it, the implication of what Jesus is talking about here is that sexuality and identity, uh, who has the right to put markers as to in the spectrum of sexuality, um, and our bodies and our gender identity, who has the right to make the determination where the cutoffs are and, and to say you can only have a partner that, is, that looks like this and you can only have a partner that looks like this. And it just, for me, it just seemed to make so much sense, you know, that this is, I really think that this is what Jesus was implying. He was getting his disciples to be aware that sexuality and gender identity and all that is more com complex than just black and white. The other, the other thing about uh, these, um, uh, this warning, 
or this uh, teaching device is that it has so also served as a warning for me because it made me realize not everyone's going to get a, a, uh, understand or agree with me because people people are going to say no I've uh, I've deluded myself I've you've decided to do this and you're totally wrong you're misquoting scripture and all this kind of stuff and and I I've I haven't encountered a lot of um, opposition. I have had one individual who just railed against me and started quoting scripture and told me that I was totally wrong. And so I've thought about it. Am I getting it wrong? You know, there, there's always that doubt. Am I deluding myself? I'm, I'm trying, am I listening or hearing only what I want to hear? And I decided, I, I concluded that there is evidence. I, I, we don't have to, time to really um, look at the, the passage, but all you have to do is Google it, and if you have a Bible, uh, look it up. It's in the book of Acts, this, the account of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And what's interesting about that story, it's, an, it's a fascinating account of a, an interaction that Philip has with this Ethiopian eunuch who's come to Jerusalem for the Passover at the time that Jesus is um, tried and executed. And he's, going now, he's now going back to Ethiopia when uh, Philip has this encounter with him on the road. Philip explains, he unpacks a whole bunch of stuff for him. This person comes to believe in, in, uh, in the message that Philip has for him. And as they approach the waters, uh, here's the question. Uh, what's interesting about the story is the question that the eunuch asks, the answer that he gets, and the statement that follows. The question that he asks is, what prevents me from being baptized? The answer is, nothing prevents you from being baptized. And the statement that follows is, he went on his way rejoicing back to Ethiopia after he was baptized. What's interesting about that question and that answer is that I think it, it for me, it satisfied me, satisfy, satisfies me that I got it right. Because I believe the disciples must have grappled with this teaching that Jesus gave them about marriage and divorce. And they must have talked about it. And... Uh, the fact is that they were very devout Jews themselves. They would have done the same thing, probably held the same views that, that this, well, let me tell you, the, the background is that as a eunuch, even though he was a devout Jew and had made this huge journey to be in Jerusalem, he was still excluded because he was considered ceremonially unclean. He could not participate fully in everything that took place during the Passover. Yet he went anyway because it, he was a devout, believing person. And so the question is full of heartfelt, it's like he's saying, look, I've been a devout uh, a religious person all my life, and I'm still excluded because of my, uh, because of my other sex uh, identification. Is it going to be the same thing if I believe what you're telling me? That's really what the question is asking. He's, it's not that he wants to start playing by the new rules and feels that he needs to be baptized. I think the question is more, do I have permission to be part of this? Can I, and can I partake in it? And Philip's answer that yes, I will baptize you. You can be identified with me, you will, and I will identify myself with you. You are an equal. We can participate in this together. That is the message of inclusion. And I think the challenge for me, and I think it's a valid challenge for all of us actually, even if you don't. Um, what will happen? And you know, statistically. Uh, some people say that uh, gender dysphoria affects about 3% of the population. At least in a group like this, there could be one or two other people who might have some form of gender dysphoria. It could be mild or it could be severe. Mine was pretty severe. And, or maybe there isn't. Maybe I'm the only person here. But chances are that any one of you could be related to someone who is. And if you're a parent, it could be a child or it could be your own, one of your own parents, or it could be a sibling, or it could be an aunt, or an uncle, or a niece, or a nephew, or someone that works for you, or someone that you work with, or your boss, or someone you see at the gym. It could be anybody who has yet found the, the desperation to come to the point where they feel they need to just kind of open the doors of their lives and talk about what, what they feel they are inside. And so the question is, how do we respond to someone like that? Do we say to them, no, sorry, you can't participate in my life, and I don't think I, I can be part of yours anymore. I, I think Vancouver is a very tolerant place, and I, I would probably, uh, I would wager that most of you are pretty accepting and tolerant. But I think we need to up the ante, in, especially in view of the 
number of suicides in, in recent weeks in the states um, of uh, GLBT young people, college and high school kids, who have heard, have picked up bits and pieces of information and their brains have painted a pretty, pretty catastrophic picture of what their lives will be like and they've decided to look for the exit door. And that's really sad. And so we need to be more than tolerant because to be tolerant means that it's, you can put up with it. It's, it's like when we say my body can tolerate certain bacteria and certain infections, it can fight certain things off, it means that you can put up with it. And in some ways, uh, acceptance is also not enough. It's res like resignation. It's kind of like you accept the fact that you're going to die one day. You're resigned to that. We need to be more than that. And I was going to end by saying that what we need to do oops, is to affirm and to embrace because that's really ultimately what we all yearn for. But um, in view, uh, I prepared these slides on the 15th, started on the 15th of September, and, and then all these suicides. And I, um, it's really, um, you know, I, I was talking to a friend who is uh, very involved in trying to raise awareness among churches, you know, about uh, about this whole issue. And uh, and she was she was suggesting that that what I really needed to say is that we need to become advocates and we need to become defenders. Um, f especially for the younger people who are struggling with this, it might, might still be a secret, but they're struggling with their identity or their sexuality, and um, and we need to kind of, in a sense, cut a path for them so that they can walk safely as equals. And I think that's the what we need to do. So what that means is that in we overhear overhear a conversation and somebody makes a homophobic statement or a transphobic statement, to no, not let it. Not, not let that person get away with it, just to point out, hey, you don't know who might have heard you, who might be taking input right now and maybe making, might, might be at the breaking point. We need to really be careful. And that's, that's a challenge that I want to leave you with tonight. Thank you.